we need prayer that's prayer of faith. Hallelujah. Prayer that comes from the heart, deep inside. Amen. Thank you guys for praying for those who needed prayer today. I've got a message I want to share with you today. And uh, I hope that you can understand this is my Christmas message. It's the day after Christmas, but this is my Christmas message. And the title is going to excite you about Christmas. The title is this. The thief comes to kill. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The thief comes to kill. Yeah, because Christmas led into a lot of killing. Because the thief is trying to steal God's word, God's will, God's plan. And we need to be aware of the thief. If you're not prepared, if you're not protecting your family, the thief will steal and can kill and it can even destroy. But there's a word in the Bible that starts in Genesis chapter 3.15. It's the first prophecy in the word of God. It's not a prophecy that says God's going to bless you. God's going to take care of you. You're getting a new Lexus. You're going to get a Mitsubishi. You're going to have a new TV. You're going to get a raise. You're going to get a husband. That's not what the prophecy was. Genesis 3.15, after the sin in the garden, after the serpent, that old dragon, the devil, had come in. And by the way, he was not a snake. This was not a talking snake. This was the word nakash, which means a shining one. And it's poorly translated as serpent, when it should just be saying, and the shining one was more subtle than all the other creatures, all the other beings that God made. But somehow, we end up with Nakash. Now, Nakash is also a word that is translated into serpent in the Bible also. But we have to have the context to know which translation it is. So, a, a little bit of history, of course, a little bit of teaching for the teacher. Amen? But right now, Genesis 3.15, God looks at Eve because Adam blamed her. What you got to say for yourself, girl? He says to Adam, what do you got to say for yourself, boy? And he says, well, you know, the woman you gave me, she gave me the apple to eat. You know, so he blames God, yeah, and he blames her. That's what we all do. We shift the blame. We always shift the blame. Shift the blame. Put it on somebody else. Amen? So Adam is left out of that. He's just like, forget about it. Now, Adam was the king of the earth. you got to understand something. Adam was the first king of the earth. Adam was the first priest that God put on the earth who was a king priest. And Adam was a prophet because whatever he said, whatever he called the thing, that's what it was. So he was a king, a priest, and a prophet. He was a Melchizedek priest. More about that in a future message. But he, he had dominion. And when he disobeyed the word of God, he gave up the dominion. He gave up the kingdom. And he lost it. But God addresses Eve, and then he addresses Satan. And he says this, he says, I am going to put hatred between you two. And between your seed. He says, your seed will bruise his head. And then he says, and your seed will crush his heel, bruise his heel. He's saying to Satan, you're going to have a victory, but he says to Eve, your seed is going to have a victory too. And we know how the victory wins, how the victory turns out. But what God is saying is that he's saying, I'm going to put hatred between you two. The word enmity in the King James means hatred. It means also hostility. It means action. Someone can hate and not do anything. But when the devil hates you, he's going to do something. And when the seed of the woman hates evil, he's going to do something. He hated evil. Jesus was the seed of the woman. He hated evil and he cleansed the temple. Zeal of my father's house says, eat me up, he says. And he made a whip and he started whipping people and knocking over tables. He took action because he hated that evil. Satan is coming after him. He's been doing things already to try to stop him from coming. This hostility is what I call, and what others are calling, 
receive war. You see, the Bible is not a storybook about how God blesses you. The Bible is a war book. It's a book about war. War between heavenly forces, otherworldly forces, and earthly forces. It's a war. And the first prophecy is, it's going to be a battle. There's going to be a battle in this war. And it's going to be the culmination of all the other battles. Now, there's another prophetic word that God gives. Sometimes the prophets give words, but sometimes God himself begins to speak. And God was the one who spoke and gave that prophetic word. And he says what? I will put hatred between your seed and the seed of the woman. Between Satan's seed and the seed of the woman. The second prophecy that he brings out is in Genesis 15. And he calls Abraham. And we know the story of the call of Abraham and how he left everything. He dropped his sack and he followed the Lord. Come on, somebody, somebody say amen. He dropped that sack and followed the Lord. Amen. And he gives a word to him. And he says to Abraham in chapter 15, Genesis 15, 13, he says, I know for certain, and I want you to know for sure, your offspring, your descendants, will be sojourners in a land that is not their own. And they will become servants there. And they will be afflicted for four hundred years. I just like to get a prophecy. You did not have nothing but trouble for the next forty years. We don't live for four hundred, so I'll just make it something to do with You're going to have trouble for forty years, God says. God said to Abraham, your descendants are going to leave this land I've given you. They're going to go to a strange land. They're going to be strangers in a strange land. Then they're going to become servants, and we actually know that they became slaves. And they were afflicted four hundred years. For 400 years they were in the sea. It got worse and worse and worse. 40 is the number of testing, and 40 times 10 is even more testing. 10 is the number of judgment also. It's the number of God's divine order. 10 commandments, 10 plagues. 10 is the divine order. And so God gives this prophetic word there. He gives a specific period of time. Guess who's listening? The servant. Maybe not him, but he's got, a, got one of his little peeps out of here listening in. What did he say? I heard him speaking to Abraham over there. What did he say? He said his descendants are going to become servants and be afflicted for 400 years. Mark that down. What? They're just slaves for the 400 years. I don't care that they're afflicted. I don't care that they become slaves. I don't care nothing about them. I care about that 400 years because you see, the seed's going to come from the woman. Maybe that's the seed that's going to come in 400 years. I gotta be ready. I gotta stop the seed. The only way to beat this war is to avoid that seed. I gotta kill the seed. The Lord gave that specific time frame. Satan makes a move when it's time for them to get delivered. The 400 years comes up, and he says, We gotta do something. What are they gonna do? We don't know which one it is. We don't know who's, who it's going to be. Kill them all. Every boy, kill them when they're born. He tells the, 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 the handmaids there, the midwives, so when, the, when the Hebrew women are going to have a baby, when you get there and you deliver that baby, if it's a boy, you kill it. If it's a girl, you let it live. And then they feared God. And they let all the boys live. And then he started rounding them up and he started killing them. And, and, and Moses, mother and father, saw that Moses was special. The Bible says they saw he was special. There was a calling on his life. He wasn't the chosen seed of the woman, but Satan didn't know that. So Satan's just going to kill them all if he can. And so they take him, of course, they put him in the, in the little ark of safety, just like Noah's ark. And they put him out in the river. And where does he end up? In Pharaoh's house. And his enemies feed him and take care of him. God can turn your thing around. Those that are against you can end up for you. They will turn against you later on, but enjoy it while you got it. 
Exodus 1, 15 to 17, the Pharaoh told them, when those women are having those babies, you kill those boys. Because the thief comes to kill. The thief comes to kill. Hallelujah. The thief comes to kill. Well, it ended up that Moses, of course, was not the seed of the woman, but he was the great deliverer, and he did lead the people out. So Satan says, all right, somebody else is coming. We're going to find out. we got to keep going. we got to start watching. We've got to listen to the prophetic words that God sends to the people because he never does anything unless he tells his prophets. So when this Messiah is going to get born, there's going to be prophecy about it. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 2. He finds out that something's going on. He finds out that there's a, that, that there's a baby being born. And he finds out that this baby that was born is the Messiah. He is the chosen seed. How in the world, since it's Christmas time, how in the world did the Magi know that Jesus was going to be born in, in Bethlehem, in the city of David? Or they didn't know that, but they came to Jerusalem to see the, the king that was born. How did they know he was coming? Because of the prophecies in the word of God. The prophecies in the Word of God spoke about it. And how did they know about the prophecies in the Word of God? Because God had a young prince, one of the king's sons, back in the days in the first year of Nebuchadnezzar. When Nebuchadnezzar was king the first year, he went and attacked Jerusalem, and he took away the princes of the people, the king's seed. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel. These weren't just kids. These were the lineage of the kings. And he took them away. And Daniel, of course, we know Daniel ends up becoming a great man because God gives him the ability to understand dreams and visions, and he has all this wisdom, and Nebuchadnezzar raises him up after Daniel is given a vision that uh, 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 of, of something Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and couldn't think of the dream, couldn't remember it, and was going to kill all the wise men, all the magicians, all the astrologers, all the Chaldeans, all the Magi. He was going to kill all the Magi. Daniel found out and said, wait, we're going to pray. You guys with me? You're praying? You got a prayer team going. And they began to pray. And he said, just give us a couple of days. I'm going to come back and I'm going to give you the dream and the interpretation. And he does. And Nebuchadnezzar bows down before him and says to him, oh, Daniel, there is no God like your God. He is a revealer of dreams. He is the one who can do these things. And he says, I want Daniel to be lifted up and raised up. So this prince of the Hebrews becomes the prince of the Babylonians. God is saying to some people who are going to watch this and listen to this, you need to get into politics. You're a prince of God. You are a chosen generation, a royal generation. And you need to get into politics. God wants godly men and women in politics because they're the ones that understand the things of God and they're the ones that are going to fight for what's right. Amen? We ought to get a prayer team going to pray for America. Some people are doing it already, aren't they? They're praying for politicians. Not for just politics. I don't even care about the politicians. I want godly people to be raised up. To be raised up before God. Amen. Thank you. Sean Hyland, a friend of mine, is running for office in New Jersey. He's the head of a, of, a, of a Christian family policy council. And he's decided to get in politics. You need to pray for him. His picture's in the hallway. I put up a poster for him. I want you to pray for him for the next year so when the election comes, he gets elected and not some lackey for the, for the devil. Amen? Yeah. We need righteous men and women like Daniel. Now, Daniel, the Bible says when Daniel gave Nebuchadnezzar the, the dream and the interpretation, Nebuchadnezzar put him over all of the others in Babylon and made him the chief of the Magi, the Chaldeans, the astronomers, and all those guys. But just, he was the head of them all. And Daniel used his position to tell them all about the coming prince who will, a star, shall rise in Judah. And how he was going to come. And how the seed of the woman was going to come forth and crush the head of the Satan seed. 
And he begins to teach them. So when Jesus is born, the Magi see his star. Why did they see his star? They were looking for it. They were looking for it. You can't find it unless you're looking for it. Some of us got to start seeking God. Start looking for the things of God. Amen. And so I just wanted to throw that in about how did the Magi ever know that Jesus was the Messiah and he was born out of Judah, that the star rose in Judah, out of Bethlehem and all that. And how did, how did the, the priests of Herod know he was, he's going to be born in Bethlehem? It's in the word. It was prophesied in the Bible. And now Bethlehem are not the least. You're the, you're the least, but out of you shall come the deliverer. So it's prophesied. God speaks his word. Amen. So Matthew chapter 2 tells us that when Herod was mocked by the wise men, after he, these magi, after he sent them to go find the Lord and worship him and give him the gifts, they were going to come back and tell him where he was so that Satan could kill Jesus. But the magi were warned in a dream. God will give a dream to an unbeliever. God will lead them also. And that's how they become believers. Amen. How did you get saved? You weren't born saved. You were born a sinner. You were born again because God gave you some understanding and led you to it. Amen. So Satan knew that Messiah, the seed of the woman, had been born and he had Herod kill all the babies. I mean, if there's nothing sadder than that, I want to tell you, it's sad of what happened there. Innocent babies killed. Two years old and three years old. Because that's how they determined when the star came and how they got there. Jesus, the Messiah, escaped. Moses escaped. Jesus escaped. When the tribulation comes, do you plan to escape? You can. If you're in Christ. If you're seeking the kingdom. If you're following hard and pressing in, like Andrew said before, you got to press in. If you're pressing in, He'll be there with you. Amen? Oh, Lord. So, Moses, the deliverer, was not in the seat of the one, although the serpent tried to destroy him. Herod tried to kill the Messiah because Satan put it in his heart to kill them. And the Apostle John, later on, when he begins to see the visions of Revelation, he begins to see these things. And it's in Revelation 12 that he sees this. And he says this in Revelation 12, starting in verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder or sign in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. Upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child, travailing in birth, in pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder or sign in the heavens. Now, where do we get these signs in the heavens? you got to go back to Genesis when God created the stars and the planets. And he set them in the heavens as signs. For signs and for seasons. They're not just here to tell us the seasons. They're here for signs, supernatural signs. How many of you know that Satan never counterfeits anything that's not of value? Does any, has anybody ever counterfeited a penny? It's not that valuable. Wow, you're smart. <laughs> Satan doesn't counterfeit pennies. But he will counterfeit signs in the heavens. How does he do that? The horoscope. He takes something that God set in the heavens and he counterfeits it and he turns it into what sign are you? I'm a Libra. I'm a Virgo. I'm a lion. I'm a Leo. I'm a Pisces. I'm a crab. You are a crab. But anyway, <laughs> you know, I, I really, I, when people always ask me, what sign are you? And they tell me, I'm this. I say, I'm born under the sign of the cross. And they're like, well. But you see, that's the, 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 see, the signs in the heavens were set there by God. But Satan counterfeits it. Now, when he says there's a virgin in the sky, who's the virgin in the sky? Virgo. That's a constellation of stars. Right? And when it says there's a dragon, what's that? That's the, that's the dragon, the Hydra. There's another old constellation. Today we see there's two constellations. It's the Scorpio type. It's, it's the Scorpion. And 
in the old days, it was one constellation, the scorpion, and they called it the dragon. Now it's two constellations, because God, again, has broken it down into two parts. But the Bible says that there was a sign. God says, a sign in the heavens, a woman, a woman appeared, cold with the sun, the moon under her feet. Back several years ago, 2015, there was something that took place in the heavens. A sign took place. Virgo was in a position where the sun was above her head. She was in a position where the, our moon was under her feet. She was in a position where the dragon constellation was off to the side. And the Bible says, and, and she was with child travailing in birth. And she was in a position, listen, Virgo was in a position where Jupiter, which has always been called the king planet, was actually in transit, it's called. Jupiter is going up and down in the center of Virgo for nine months. Hello? For nine months, Jupiter was going up and down in Virgo. Literally, this was taking place in 2015. And because she had a crown of 12 stars, there was a constellation above, and that constellation had nine stars, and there were three planets attached with it, making a crown of 12 lights in the heavens. This happened in 2015. Something is happening. Overcomers are going to be born. Satan's going to try to kill. We need to understand these things. So, it says this. It says, she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And you know, that the amazing thing is that God set this whole thing up as a picture in the sky, and Jupiter, the king planet, is going back and forth in transit for nine months, and then at the end of nine months, he leaves. And he goes on his circuit to heavens. And the Bible says here that there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, seven crowns upon his heads, and with his tail he drew a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man son. Your Bible might say man child, but the actual, the actual wording is a man son, not a baby boy. A man, a full grown son. And her child was called to God and to his throne. Now, Satan is out to kill, steal, and destroy. And this is a picture of him trying to kill Jesus when he was born. And it happened 2,000 years ago. But if this sign just appeared six years ago, God must be saying something to us. Because it literally appeared in the heavens. Look it up. Go online. Virgo in, in the sky, you know, Jupiter in transit. Well, how do you want to work it up? If you, actually, if you have an astronomical program on your, on, your, on your computer, you can plug it in and you can go back to 2015 and you can watch and you can see the whole thing taking place. Something is happening. Now, his plans were ruined. He went to destroy the son, the man's son, but he couldn't because he was called to God. And what happens? Verse 17. The dragon was filled with wrath against the woman. And he went to make war. I'm talking about the seed war. I'm talking about the seed of the woman and the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, the overcomer. The remnant. Satan is at war with the remnant today. This war broke out in full force six years ago. And he's after those who would be overcomers. Those called to rise up above, those called to press in, those called to give it all or bust. You see, not everybody's called that way. You've got five wise and five foolish. You've got the five wise that got the extra oil. You've got the five foolish they didn't bring any extra. They weren't prepared. They weren't preppers. They weren't prepared. And then they said to the, to the preppers, hey, give us what you got. And the preppers said, oh, wait, you're not getting what we got. We worked hard to get this. And we're holding on to it. See, these are spiritual principles that are applying to today. You've got to get ready for what's coming. Bad times are here, and things are getting worse. We're in a situation where war is breaking out, and the thief is here to kill. And you need to 
to war with Jesus. You need to tap into God, tap into the Holy Spirit. He's at war not only with the woman's seed, he lost that war. He lost that battle. Jesus was born. He thought he won when they crucified the Lord of glory and Jesus died on the cross. All of hell broke loose in laughter and celebration. But three days later, when he rose from the dead, they started hiding and running away because Jesus crushed his head. When he stepped on it, he was healed. Prophecy was coming to pass. So Satan says, hmm, lost that battle. I'm going after the woman. But the Bible says that God gave the woman some safety and some and things like that to help her get away. And then Satan says, I'm going after the seed of the lamb. First thing in Gideon's day. When they're going to fight an overwhelming force, and I want to tell you, Satan is an overwhelming force. He's more powerful than you. He's smarter than you. He knows the Bible better than us. He's an overwhelming force. The first thing that Gideon said, God told Gideon, the prophetic word from God said to Gideon, tell everybody who's afraid, they can go home, it's okay. And I'll tell you, there's a word going out in the spirit in the church. If you're afraid, don't get in this battle. Just go home. And people are going home. They won't come to church. They won't meet with the saints. They won't fellowship. Fear has gripped them, and they're staying away. Oh, and I know you'll be mad at me, but I'm sorry. We have to get to the place where we're not afraid, where we walk in faith. And even after those who are afraid of hope, what happened next? Those who were used to bowing your knee down to false gods and false idols, he took them away also, and he was left with 300 out of 30,000. A remnant. And Satan is after you, the remnant. If you are happy to be called an overcomer, if you're happy to have the label of a remnant, the remnant of God, you better get your armor on. You better get ready for battle. You better not think this is going to be a picnic or a cruise. You know, I love that Christian cruise ship that goes around Manhattan. I think it's great. But you know what? That's not the ship that I'm on. That's for the fearful. That's for those who are afraid. That's for those who are used to, you know, bowing their knee to the things of the earth. But the overcomers, we're going on the battleship. We're looking for the aircraft carrier. Amen? We're going into war. We train for this. We're supposed to get ready for this. We're supposed to get built up for this. You know that soldiers actually itch to get into a battle? They actually itch for it. Like, when are we going to war? When are we going to battle? We train for this. We're ready for this. We're ready to defend and protect. We're ready to go after the enemy and kill the enemy. When are we going to get turned loose? And that's how God wants his troops. Troops, are you ready to get turned loose? We don't fight flesh and blood. We are recognizing the spirit behind people. The manipulating spirit that's behind people that's causing them to do what they do. And we don't attack the people. We go after the spirit. And how do we go after the spirit? We humble ourselves. And we submit ourselves to God. See, some people are demon chasers. They put a button on, I'm a demon, demon chaser. They get buckets out. They're going to call demons out. They're gonna, they get into all this stuff. All the demons to demons. We don't do that. That's not what it's at. The Bible says, submit yourself to God and resist the devil, and the devil will flee. We don't shout at the devil. The Bible says, even Michael the archangel, when disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not accuse him or speak loudly against him, but just said, God's will be done. We're not here to yell at the devil. You don't have to win a spiritual battle because you shout real loud. I bind you, Satan. I bind you. Can't even, you cannot bind Satan. You can't. Think about it for a second. You are going to bind the devil. The devil's not going to get bound until the end of the tribulation and Jesus returns. And when Jesus returns, he'll be bound for what? A thousand years. We're not binding Satan. I bind you, Satan. I command you. You can't command the devil. He laughs at that stuff. These are doctrines of devils themselves. They're here to put the church in confusion. Splitting the church with all this confusion. You can work. You wrestle against these things spiritually. You're wrestling. You're not 
giving in to temptation. You're, you're resisting the enemy. And when you do that, they will walk away. They will flee. That's how you fight the spiritual battles. So, uh, shameless plug, get my book on spiritual warfare. It's about to understand spiritual battles, spiritual warfare, understanding the battle. Very cheap on Amazon. $10 here. I'm not kidding. I wrote a book about this. So I don't have to preach it every day. So anyway, he is now focused on the remnant of the seed. We are not the seed. We are the remnant of the seed. Because we are the ones who are not afraid. We are the ones who are standing strong in the Lord. We know that Satan is trying to do things to get us. And it tells us in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verse 25. He shall speak great words against the Most High. And he shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Satan cannot kill you. You are protected by the blood of Jesus. Satan cannot steal everything from you as long as you're submitting to God. He cannot destroy what God has given you. But you need to understand something. He is going to try to wear you out. He's going to try to make you quit. He's going to make you try to walk away. He can't kill you, so he'll make you walk away. He'll wear you out. How does he wear you out? The word wear out in the text, in the actual Hebrew, in Aramaic, it actually means to wear them out mentally, emotionally. That's what he's trying to do. You got troubles, you got problems and situations that are just wearing you out, wearing you out. That's his plan because he can't kill you. He's trying to wear you out. That's his plan. But the Word of God also tells us in Revelation chapter 12, right in that same chapter with the woman and the dragon and the child and the man and the remnant, says in chapter 12, chapter 12 verse 11, and they, who? The remnant of the seed, they overcame him, who? The dragon, the devil. How? By the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. They were willing to drop their sack. And follow Jesus. They were willing to let go of the things of the earth and follow Jesus. When the word of God comes out in Revelation 19 and it talks about Babylon falling, the word comes to the people of God and says, come out of Babylon, my people. Come out of this world system. Come out of this thing that fills your mind with you want this and you want that and you need this and you deserve that. Come out of that system and seek the kingdom first. All these things will be given unto you. He takes care of the birds. How much more will he take care of you? He knows when a sparrow falls from the sky. He will take care of you if you trust him. If you run around like Chicken Little, you're not going to get anything except confusion, which is what Babylon means. People are in confusion because of bad doctrines, bad teachings, and things like that. So you need to stay under the blood of Jesus. Oh, I am protected by the blood of the Lamb. I thank you, Lord. I'm put, what did they do in Egypt? They put the blood of the Lamb on the doorpost and the lintel. The doorpost and the lintels, that's three sections of a doorway. What it means is they put it at the top and they put it on the two sides. And when they did that, they shook the hyssop in the blood and they sprayed it on the top and they hit the top and then they put it in, they hit the side and hit the side. They made a cross on the door. They hit the doorpost and the lintels and they made a cross on the door. And the blood protected them. They were under the blood. We need to stay under the blood. you got to keep your mind under the blood. You've got to remember the blood has power. Life is in the blood. And this is spiritual stuff we're talking about. Hallelujah. Stay under the blood. And share the word of your testimony. Satan's trying to shut you up. Don't talk about that, Yaxdell. You'll offend somebody. Don't preach it. Don't preach what you preach. You'll offend somebody. Keep quiet. That's the devil's tactic. Keep you quiet. Because if you're quiet, you can be under the blood. If you're quiet, you're not doing number two. There's two steps in this. Stay under the blood and share your testimony. Keep talking about the things that God has done. You know, sometimes in church I'll say, how many people have, anybody have a testimony? <laughs> you mean God's not doing nothing? The Bible says, you need to be ready all the time. To talk about the things the Lord has done. 
It doesn't matter if it didn't happen yesterday, it could have happened 10 years ago. You've got a testimony to share. And by sharing that testimony, you break the emotional stress of feeling you're changed. Well, if you share that, they're going to reject you. No, honey, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me, Jesus says. Share your testimony. Speak about the things of God. Open wide thy mouth, and God says, and I will fill it. He says to the he says to the man of God before he's going to die, he says to him, don't worry about what you'll say. I'll give you what to say. What did David do when he couldn't go to sleep? He went and read through the books and the chronicles. And remember, they, what did the other kings do? They went through the acts and they rehearsed the things that God had done. And they remembered, and the Bible says that when David was discouraged and he was uh, thinking of suicide, because what happened to his wife and his children and all the, all the wives and the children of the men of God that were with him, they came back to their place and they were stolen and taken away. And they were saying, we should kill David. Look what he did to us. He led us in the wrong way. And David's like, i got to kill myself. Forget about them. And then the Bible says, but David encouraged himself in the Lord, and he remembered the promises of God. And he spoke to himself, and he said to himself, why art thou cast down on my soul? Why art thou so quiet within me? Hope thou in God. I will hope in God. And he begins to testify. Even Jesus in Psalm 22, after the crucifixion, the Bible says there's a break in Psalm 22 of the crucifixion and then the resurrection. And the first thing it says in that break, it says, I will declare your name to my brethren. I'm going to speak about the things of God. It's time the church opens its mouth. Thank you. Oh, you don't mix. Don't mix. You know, there's one thing you don't do when your family's together. You talk about religion. Is that what you got? You got a religion? If you got a religion, don't talk about it. Don't talk about it to me either. I don't want to hear about religion. But if you got a relationship with Jesus, you need to tell somebody. You need to get under the blood and get your testimony going. Now listen, here's a little extra thought. Was Jesus the physical seed of the woman? Yeah, he was a, Jesus was a real man, wasn't he? But he was the son of God. Because it was her child, but God was his father. If the seed of the woman is a real man, who's the seed of Satan? Oh, it's just a figure of speech. No, it's going to be a real man. Satan will be the father. It's going to be a Nephilim. Nephilim means a child of a fallen angel and a human woman. That's what he's going to be. He may be born and ready. He could have been born in 2015. I don't know. I'm not going to say, well, yes, he is no time. But it's very, very real chance that he was already born. And he's growing up underneath the auspices of the devil. And he's growing in wisdom and knowledge and favor with Satan. Jesus grew up with wisdom and knowledge and favor with God and man. Seed of Satan is going to do the same thing. This is what the Bible tells us about this. It says that this, this seed of the devil is going to be a miracle. And by the miracles will deceive many. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8 says this. The lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will destroy with the breath of his mouth, rendering him powerless by the manifestation of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be accompanied by the power of Satan. The Bible tells us in Revelation that the Antichrist was given all the authority of the dragon. That the power of Satan. He will use every kind of power, including miraculous signs and lying wonders. Lying because they point to him and the devil, not to God. They're still wonders. They're miraculous. Every type of evil he will use to deceive those who are dying, who refuse to love the truth that would save them. That's what Paul said. So this lawless one, this seed of the devil, is coming if he's not here already. So I want to encourage you. I've got something to say to you. Because the thief is coming to kill. And the lawless one is coming to kill. And there's going to be trouble. There's going to be problems. But if you're tapped into the Lord, you can have water when nobody else does. You can have
have peace when nobody else does. You can have a relationship with God when nobody else does. You don't have to be afraid when everybody else is. You can stand in the Lord. Look, look at this in, in Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10. Finally, my brothers and sisters, be strong in the Lord. It's the same thing that Moses told Joshua. Be strong and courageous. Courage doesn't mean you have no fear. Courage means you don't have no fear. You have no faith. Courage is you stand up to fear and look fear in the face. And say, I'm under the blood. And I've got a testimony. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on, therefore, the whole armor of God. You got a lot of Christians walking around dragging their armor. This stuff's heavy, man. I can't use this all the time. I don't even carry it no more. Mine's at home. I got mine in the closet. I'm still saying, I'm still child of God. Yeah, but you hung your hair. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the strategies and the schemes of the devil. King James says wiles of the devil, wiles of the wicked one. It means strategies and schemes, wearing out tactics. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. For we wrestle, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against wicked spirits in heavenly places. Therefore, take on the whole armor of God so you can stand in the evil day. Having done all to stand, stand therefore. Having your words, loins girt out the truth. The loins are the reproductive area of the body. If you're reproducing lies and fear and all that stuff, you're not walking with God. Gird your life with truth and reproduce the truth of the Lord. I'm under the blood and I've got a testimony. And I'm an overcomer. And I'm not going to be afraid. I'm going to stand in the Lord. Why? Because I'm putting on the armor of God. And I'm going to have the Lord keep me away from temptation. And deliver me from the evil one. Hallelujah. Have your loins girt with truth. Have the breastplate of righteousness on them. You've got to have a forgiving heart, a right heart. You've got to have a heart that is loving others no matter what's going on. And have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Every place you go, you're a blessing. Stop speaking baloney. Stop talking junk. Stop. Oh, man, things are hard. Things are so tough, man. It gets worse every day. Things are hard. It gets worse all the time. But don't walk around like a sad sack. Things are hard, but I'm getting stronger. Hallelujah. I'm getting prepared. I'm putting on the armor of God. I'm girding myself with truth. I'm not going to speak a lie. I'm going to speak the truth in love. I'm going to have my feet ready to talk about Jesus, to walk and bring me to places where I can bring the peace of God. And I'm going to take the shield of faith, and I'll stop all those fiery arrows of the enemy. And I'll take the helmet of salvation, and I won't listen to anything else but the word of God. And I'll put on the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And I will hold on to it. You see, the thing about the sword of the Spirit is, it turns every which way by itself. God don't need you to defend him. He put the sword here to defend us. When he put Adam and Eve out of the garden of Eden, it says he put there a flaming sword and two cherubim. And the sword turned by itself. You just have to hold on to it. It'll turn you. It'll turn you. Lead me, Lord. Where's my enemy? How do I defeat this one? Humble yourself. Humble yourself before the mighty hand of God. Above all, take the shield of faith, and you shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray all the time with all kinds of prayer and supplications. Supplications mean begging. Sometimes you have to feel like you're begging. It's okay. You don't ever beg God. Sometimes I'm going to... I feel, I'm just like, oh God, please, I, I, I need your help. I'm not begging in public, begging in my private prayer room. All kinds of prayer. And watching there on two with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and pray for others too, and ask God to take care of others too. And then verse 19 says this, and I'll close with this. And don't forget to pray for me. So I can preach the word of God boldly, without fear of what man may 
ਦੱਸਿਆ ਮੈਂ